Ladies and gentlemen, in the last lecture we were talking about the generation of mantle magma due to the release of uh, hydrous fluids from a downgoing slab from the oceanic crust via the breakdown of hydrous minerals, which might include chloride, serpentine, amphibole, and uh, these fluids, they drop the solidus from a dry mantle solidus in the overlying asthenosphere down to a, a wet solidus, a fluid saturated solidus uh, which lies at lower temperatures and uh, this will allow partial mantle melting as we see here in schematic sketches where hot dry asthenospheric mantle rock would not be able to melt uh, but as soon as you infiltrate hydrous fluids uh, the solidus drops and melt can be generated and can be extracted to higher lithospheric or to crustal levels uh, where we then would form a volcanic arc on top of a subduction zone. Here we see the two uh, regions uh, in the Earth mantle that produce partial melt and uh, have in this way a very important uh, impact on uh, plate tectonics on the generation of, for instance, oceanic lithosphere uh, via decompression melting along or underneath um, the mid-oceanic ridges and uh, such mid-oceanic ridges uh, can be connected uh, via breakup of continents to subduction zones. We see this here. These two regions can be, they are not always, but they can be um, mutually related because here subduction of an oceanic lithosphere um, is uh, producing also partial melt by a different process. Fluid assisted melting, hydrous fluids as we have seen infiltrate into the mantle, lower the solidus. Here the decompression of hot mantle material will allow to hit the solidus of dry, of dry asthenosphere. Uh, so here these um, what we call back arc basins, uh, extensional basins, can be mechanically linked to such subduction zones. Uh, I don't want to go in, into greater detail in this matter, but uh, you should know that sometimes uh, the back arc, the area behind such continental island arcs like the Andes, um, are not undergoing contraction, so crustal shortening, as we see in the Andes, sometimes extension can be a response to such subduction. How that works we will see in uh, the second and third year courses, particularly in the third year course we will talk about these processes in much more detail. Again here the two uh, diagrams that uh, relate to the two processes, decompression melting, uh, below mid-oceanic ridges, uh, transports uh, mantle material sitting on the oceanic geotherm or the continental geotherm. Um, if we can achieve decompression melting in such settings, we will uplift such hot material without cooling it and this might then bring the mantle material um, physically to a position where it is hotter than the normal geotherm and lies at the solidus or beyond the solidus here of uh, mantle material, then we will see partial melting. So that happens under mid-oceanic ridges. Uh, here we see the other process, hydratization of the mantle above subduction zones will lower the solidus from dry mantle material forming basaltic melt to uh, the water saturated uh, solidus and this water saturated solidus in, for instance, 100 kilometers depth lies uh, quite considerably below the geotherm. That means asthenosphere at that depth with a temperature of perhaps around 1000 degrees uh, will be undergoing partial melting due to the influx of hydrous fluids. Earthquakes. Now we will talk in a separate section in much more detail about earthquakes, but of course uh, Earthquakes are related to subduction zones and to uh, continental margins that are active and we see here these uh, little stars. This is a kind of a schematic distribution of uh, locations where earthquakes typically happen and we see here uh, they start somewhere here in the area where the oceanic lithosphere starts bending down Then we find earthquakes all the way down uh, in the a downgoing plate uh, down to a certain level of about six, 680, 700 kilometers. That is where seismic activity ends. In the lower mantle we are not uh, seeing more 
uh, seismic events, uh, everything seems to be fairly soft and plastic and nothing breaks and breaking and uh, brittle sliding in a in a uh, rather hard um, environment, a very, what we say, competent environment is necessary to cause earthquakes. We also see earthquakes in the upper plate, we see here within the area of the volcanic arc, but also in the fore arc and in the back arc. There are areas that are prone to develop earthquakes. So shadow earthquakes are in the upper plate and near the trench and uh, then we have what we call the Wadati Benioff zone, that is uh, the interface of the usually close to the interface between the downgoing slab and the uh, surrounding overlying uh, asthenospheric mantle. Essentially we have seismic activity along this subductor plate, within the subductor plate and close to the interface. Then we see here at deeper level in the lower mantle we see that the subduction zone starts disintegrating, breaking up into individual uh, fragments and these fragments then individually slowly sink down uh, to uh, perhaps the core mantle boundary into the deeper uh, lithosphere. Sometimes uh, you will uh, see the term or hear the term uh, uh, graveyard of plates, graveyard of uh, oceanic lithosphere. So they are sinking down there, they are sl slowly getting hotter and hotter and more and more similar to the surrounding mantle until they cannot be identified or distinguished from the surrounding mantle by using geophysical methods. Important is that these processes in the lower mantle are not related to seismic activity. Um, this is an aseismic process. Let's have a look at a larger scale. Here we see a larger segment of the Earth. We see the core. We see a layer that is called a D double prime layer. And um, this is a specific layer at the interface between mantle and core. Lots of research is uh, at the moment going on to understand better what actually happens in this contact zone between solid silicic uh, lower mantle and uh, outer core that is liquid and metallic, you know it consists uh, of iron and nickel, uh, but it's uh, liquid molten molten uh, reservoir, the largest reservoir of uh, melt on the planet, that's the outer core. And uh, we see here some graphics that try to illustrate how this region actually might look like. Now you can look it up in the textbook again for more detail, but here we see a lot of plate tectonics. We see continental lithosphere with a active uh, and de type magmatic arc under which uh, oceanic plate is subducted. We see hot spots uh, within the oceanic plate, uh, islands that oceanic islands that form in the region of uh, mantle plumes, where, like in Hawaii, mantle material is exhumed, and uh, due to decompression melting, we get these hotspot island chains. You will hear about that in more detail in English petrology. We also see subduction occurring between oceanic plates. So here we see an oceanic island arc with oceanic uh, lithosphere being subducted. We see generation of uh, oceanic lithosphere with a mid-oceanic ridge. And here another island arc that subducts into the opposite direction. All these subducted plates, uh, they are slightly colder have a higher density, they are sinking down until they are getting uh, somehow amalgamated uh, into the lower mantle and then we see areas where hot lower mantle material is actually rising and the geometry of such areas uh, again is not very well understood but obviously if you bring mantle material or lithospheric material into the mantle downwards something has to go upwards and uh, so there must be an interplay between subducted oceanic lithosphere and rising uh, mantle material to hot spots or also here to mid-oceanic ridges which is not properly shown here. This is another diagram that illustrates mobility of mantle material. Again we have here the outer core which is very hot. It interacts with the lower asthenosphere, uh, with the lower mantle and here there might be regions where very hot material gathers and collects and then finally 
uh, finds its way upwards as a mantle plume that might produce something like Hawaii, like the Hawaiian uh, hotspot volcanoes, large shield volcanoes. And uh, uh, here we see again uh, downgoing lithospheric slabs, the plate graveyard that I have mentioned before, and also convection cells. So it is believed, and uh, there is good evidence and indication for that, that mantle, asthenospheric mantle material, uh, moves in some sort of circular patterns, not as regular as uh, you might find in older textbooks, but uh, somehow hot material will rise and colder material will sink down. That is similar like uh, water in a boiling pot. Uh, if you do that, you, you will uh, see that uh, water convects and so does hot plastic mantle material. It also convects. Uh, within the mantle and uh, that obviously has an impact on the overlying lithospheric plates. Here another illustration. Uh, these are results of fairly new modeling that uh, leave out large parts of the asthenospheric mantle. Here we see uh, blue areas, we see uh, yellow areas and we see a red ball uh, here at the bottom. This ball is the core. This is the outer core that is liquid. And um, in blue we see regions where cold and dense material sinks down. These must be uh, subduction zones and fragments of oceanic lithosphere which, which are on their way uh, downwards. They are cold, therefore have a higher density and will tend to sink. Whereas other material, the yellow regions, are material that is upwelling because it is um, hotter than the average mantle and therefore tends to rise. These would be plumes and that would be material that is decompressed quickly underneath mid-oceanic ridges and uh, then will undergo partial melting. So plume material, hot mantle material on its way up will finally undergo decompression and decompression melting. These are more modern models how we believe currently that um, the transfer of material in the mantle might look like. In many textbooks you will find such models. Um, a two-layer model for instance here with deep mantle convection in regular cells where material goes downwards and other material goes upwards and uh, shallow mantle convection in a separate cell where again we see this uh, circular pattern and where uh, that is what, what was established thinking. Uh, you see it's now outdated but uh, people thought that there must be more regular cells and where two cells meet and you have upwards pointing arrows here that is where mantle material would regularly move up. But uh, for various reasons this is uh, seen as no longer um, state-of-the-art knowledge and uh, yeah, it's probably too simplistic. Uh, the planet is more irregular, more complex than thought in uh, previous years. So important is that all these convecting movements, uh, be they more regular as shown here or less regular than uh, shown here or in uh, this image here. Uh, these are the motor for plate tectonics. These movements in the plastic mantle, they move continental or oceanic lithospheric plates uh, along the surface of, of the Earth and that is driving the deformation processes that, uh, that we see on Earth. That is why the surface of the Earth is getting reshaped as a continuous process. Uh, mountains are building, mountains get eroded, plates are forming, they get destroyed again. Now this is only because the mantle is mobile. The asthenospheric mantle has a great deal of mobility that drives the surface processes. We have talked about uh, the consumption of uh, oceanic lithosphere in ND and type settings. We see that here in 3D. Oceanic lithosphere is uh, being consumed. Um, produces here a uh, hydrated uh, asthenospheric mantle that undergoes partial melting with a volcanic chain, volcanic arc. We have a trench, we have an accretionary wedge. All these matters we have discussed, but um, if we, uh, for instance, subduct mid-oceanic ridges, they are destroyed, they are down in the mantle, then uh, eventually uh, 
such oceans can, can be uh, consumed entirely and uh, eventually we will form a situation where a continent approaches another continent which leads to collision and you know that for instance the Himalaya but also the Alps in Europe have formed as a result of continent-continent convergence and eventually collision. This produces very complex um, tectonic situations in such mountain belts. Uh, what we see here does not entirely reflect, does not reflect at all uh, how complicated the geological situation in such collisional belts might be. And uh, we don't have to discuss that right now. Uh, what we need to know is that we find here somewhere a suture zone and you see along these suture zones very often we find relics of oceanic crust. Um, this is what we call ophiolites and uh, these remnants of oceanic crust in a collisional continental environment that is a good evidence that once there was an ocean separating this continent from that continent. And the boundary between such continents we call suture zone. As I said, often they are highlighted by the presence of relics of oceanic crust. Subduction stops once uh, collisional tectonics occur, once uh, continents collide. Uh, they can still converge. They will oppose a lot of stress and deformation on each other and this forms eventually these high collisional mountain belts and thickens the continental crust as we see here and uh, it thickens also the whole lithosphere. Here we see the lithospheric mantle and we see here a relic of the ocean, of this ocean that once was subducted and is breaking off, it has a high density and it sinks as detached oceanic lithospheric fragments into the asthenospheric mantle. Geophysically uh, it is possible to locate and to identify such sinking fragments underneath uh, large collisional belts uh, like the Alps or the Himalayas. Specifically in the Alps uh, quite a number of such sinking blocks of oceanic lithosphere can be identified using geophysical methods. Where are such, uh, such situations? Uh, they are highlighted here as collisional environment uh, as the Alpine Himalayan chain. You see a Tibet Plateau and the Him High Himalayas. These are typical continent-continent collisional belts. Uh, also here Iran, Turkey. Uh, these are belts where one plate collides with another plate and we see here the, the constant northward movement of uh, Africa, Arabian plate, also India of course. And also Australia is on its way north and in the future, in a few hundred million years, it might collide here with Eastern Asia at a certain stage. We also have a consumption of oceanic lithosphere here in the Cordilleras, but we have talked about that already. These are the continent-continent collisional environments. In a uh, historic view, 50 million years ago, uh, this was not so. We saw that India and Asia were still separated by uh, oceanic lithosphere, which was in the process of being consumed and this continental margin of southern Asia might have looked very similar to what we see now in South America or in parts of North America. Uh, also Africa without the Red Sea and still the Arabian plate being attached to Africa uh, Africa was uh, on the way north and it's still on the way north but again the Alps didn't exist at that time because here these fragments need still to collide with Central Europe and that happened about uh, 30 million years ago. Let's have a look at the most spectacular example of continent-continent uh, collision. Uh, the Indian subcontinent moved over the last 70 million years into its uh, current position and on the way the oceanic lithosphere between Asia and India was consumed. This is what we see today. We see here a lot of tectonics going on after the collision of the Himalayas with uh, Central Asia. Now we have formed high mountain plateaus, 4,000 meters high large plateaus, the Tibet Plateau. We see a lot of tectonics that uh, illustrate how 
the whole of Eastern Asia is in fact squeezed out of this collisional zone. We see along these fault zones a uh, eastern and southeastern movement of all these areas here which uh, comprise Vietnam, parts of China, Cambodia, Thailand. Uh, these continents are on its way to the east and the southeast uh, because India is colliding here, is shortening the crust in north-south direction and this requires an escape of these um, parts of the continent to the east and that is in fact what we call it call this style of squeezing, lateral squeezing out of continental lithosphere uh, due to collision escape tectonics. Escape tectonics here is achieved along these steep faults with uh, movement vectors that we see indicated here. We see also large uh, fault movements here in a left-handed way in this case uh, in the area of Pakistan and uh, the eastern Himalayas. These, these faults are seismically highly active and they cause major earthquakes. Whenever you hear about earthquakes in Pakistan, there is a good likelihood that they are, they are related to this large-scale fault that we see here. Here we see a cross-section through this area and uh, we see here the high Himalayas. We see here the Ganges Plains which are part of the Indian um, subcontinent. So here we see the high Himalayas and we see here highlighted the uh, situation where the highest mountains of the Himalayas formed including the this Mount Everest. Here we have crustal material, continental crustal material that is piled up along these thrust faults uh, in order to to thicken the crust and this uh, thrusting happens because we have north-south crustal shortening. This leads to the stacking of these thrust sheets and uh, piles up material that uh, initially was distributed laterally from each other. It's now sitting on top of each other and that makes this high mountain belt. Uh, this is simply so because the erosion is slower than the piling up, the tectonic piling up of material and uh, the only way to accommodate then this uh, lateral shortening, this formation of thrust slices is to grow the mountain belt upwards until it reach the, reaches the high uh, peaks that we now see in the Himalaya. And in fact the Himalaya is still growing uh, because uh, yeah, the tectonics are more effective than erosion in this example. What are we seeing here? In this region we see what we call delamination of lithospheric mantle and that means that actually in fact here where the Indian plate ends and the Indian plate does not end at the Himalayas it ends further, further north. The suture zone between the two plates is in this area here. The Asian plates are north of it. They are separate ones. Here is the Asian plate sensor stricto but there are some smaller plates in between and um, here we see uh, that the suture zone runs somehow in this region here that is the boundary of the northern the northern boundary of the Indian plate here is the subduction zone um, much of the oceans that once separated Asia from India uh, has broken off it's a fairly steep subduction zone, so much of this uh, material is removed by break-off and sinking downwards. But also here, the lithospheric mantle of uh, the plates in between Asia and India is uh, responding to the lateral shortening. And uh, this response has led to delamination to the uh, break-off of parts of this lithosphere, which sinks now downwards. And this area is replaced by hot asthenospheric mantle. This influx of hot asthenospheric mantle into this region leads to a strong heat influx and also to thermal uplift and the formation of the Tibet Plateau. This here is the Tibet Plateau, a very high plateau, uh, 4000 meters and more in altitude and this uplift is thermally supported it is a thermal uplift which, uh, due to heat influx, uh, lowers the density of this crust. This is a very high heat flow and uh, this increases the buoyancy 
in a similar way as we would see in a mid-oceanic ridge environment. Mid-oceanic ridges are also thermally supported and uh, therefore are of high topography. Here, a whole region, the whole Tibet Plateau, has been affected by high heat influx due to delamination of parts of the lithospheric mantle. So we see here the heat influx due to the influx of asthenospheric mantle and uh, this would lift, uplift the overlying now thinner lithosphere. Uh, we see here different uh, geological situations with uh, highlighting of where such situations uh, currently exist. Let's start with East Africa. Here we are witnessing the early phase of continental breakup. The East African rift is forming and we see here also uh, uprising, upwelling of the asthenospheric mantle, heat influx, volcanism and extension of the crust. This forms this graben and uh, here we might have the Somali plate and here the African plate which are in the process of uh, divergence and spreading. It's not yet seafloor spreading because the continental crust, the continental lithosphere has not yet broken up. It has not yet formed oceanic lithosphere in between as is the case in the Red Sea. Here the Red Sea is a little bit further than the East African Rift in spreading because here we already see oceanic crust has started to form. This continental breakup is um, much more advanced in the Atlantic and in the Atlantic obviously we have a large area where oceanic lithosphere has formed and this has separated uh, southern Gondwana to which uh, Africa and South America belonged. And we see here for instance at the South American uh, East Coast or along the African West Coast what we call a passive margin. Continental margin that is not a plate boundary because here continental lithosphere grades into the oceanic lithosphere. Then we have the subduction related situations like here the Andean situation where oceanic um, plates, oceanic lithosphere is subducted underneath continents. It's just the other way around because here we would have on the western side the oceanic plate, the Nazca plate, and on the eastern side the continental plate, so just flip this here, and you have the Andes. And uh, subduction we also have here in southern Europe. In southern Europe the situation is uh, more critical because we are in a situation where oceanic lithosphere almost completely has been subducted. Africa is very close to Europe and eventually continent-continent collision will also happen here between say Morocco, today's Morocco, and Spain or southern France. Uh, the Mediterranean once was a much larger ocean but it has been destroyed uh, to a very large extent. And eventually the situation will result in continent, continent collision that we see for instance in the Himalayas. We also see it in the Alps because here is a very small microplate, a small tectonic plate with continental lithosphere which is the Adriatic plate, which contains essentially Italy, that already has collided with Central Europe forming the Alps. But uh, obviously looking at the size of these two continents Western Europe and Northern Africa, continent-continent uh, collision will reach a much larger scale once Africa really hits Europe. You can have a look uh, at uh, this website, it's actually quite uh, interesting. It's uh, talking about the Wilson cycle and the Wilson cycle is pretty much what we have been discussing right now. A little bit further on this matter, just summarizing what we have been discussing, plate tectonics is about the mobile lithospheric plates which overlie the dynamic, the convecting asthenospheric mantle. Convection is more complex and more complicated in its geometry uh, than uh, previous uh, views of the matter would have thought, but that is how science advances. We see here all the different features that we have been discussing.
You should know about them, not only about the names and the terms and the positions, you also should know about the processes, how lithosphere is generated at mid-oceanic ridges, how it moves um, with, for instance, forming also transform boundaries, uh, and how it is then destroyed, and how this destruction, the subduction of lithosphere, affects the overriding plate, and uh, how the story carries on, eventually to continent-continent collision, forming large continental masses, which then might break up along continental rift zones, and the story starts again. We might form new ocean along such a former continental rift. We haven't talked much about hotspots here. I leave that for other uh, courses, and you certainly will uh, get this information at a later stage. Finally here, what is called the Wilson cycle. We have been seeing here that uh, there is a good potential that uh, these processes are actually cyclic, repeating each other, and uh, here we see how that works. This is an illustration of the so-called Wilson cycle or Wilson tectonic cycle. We might start with continent, con consolidated continents, and uh, these continents might become instable, like Africa and the East African Rift start breaking up, and this breakup might be successful, forming oceanic basins, like in the Red Sea, or at a later stage in the Atlantic, separating what used to be a coherent, uniform continental mass. Uh, oceans might grow, and uh, uh, you might form subduction zones, for instance at a continental margin, Andean situation with the subduction of oceans of the oceanic lithosphere underneath continental lithosphere, volcanic arcs will form, and uh, if the seafloor spreading cannot keep up with the subduction of such lithosphere, you might consume such oceanic basins and they will close and this is heralding continent-continent collision that we see here. India, Asia, Adriatic Plate, or and uh, Central Europe, and many, many fossil origins, mountain belts, that you have not yet heard about. They show that in the geological past, continents have collided and have formed such suture zones and uh, uh, large-scale uh, mountain belts. And uh, once such a continent-continent collision has happened, uh, the situation might become more stable. Erosion takes place, and erosion then forms consolidated continents, such as Africa, such as North America or Australia, which uh, yeah, could, at a certain stage, like Africa now, or other continents in the future, start the cycle again with continental breakup, rifting, and uh, so it goes on and on. Since this is a cycle, this cycle doesn't have an end. You cannot say uh, there is a first or a second or third stage of uh, the Wilson cycle because you could start uh, the geological story at any given stage. This was the overview on plate tectonics and uh, we are starting with a new chapter in the next lecture. Thank you very much.